my background is pony club. I was in pony club as a kid. I sent my kids to pony club. I later became the district commissioner of the local pony club and ran several different kinds of rallies and eventually became the um, regional supervisor for the uh, local region of pony club. So I've been involved in pony club about 30 years. That doesn't mean I was teaching kids the whole time. I did my share of teaching, you know, the D level kids that were like 10 years old or 13 years old. So um, I didn't do so much with the C's because that got pretty technical pretty fast. So what I'm trying to do tonight is give us the Pony Club answer. One of the things that Pony Club has been criticized about by parents disgruntled over the years is that there's the Pony Club way and there's the wrong way. Well, in Pony Club, we try to teach the right safe answer. And then if you wanna improve on that, it's fine. If you wanna do it differently, it's fine. And certainly this group is a bunch of intelligent adults I, met most of you and been super impressed and maybe envious even. But um, so, you know, it's like Pony Club says that if you go in the barn, you should always wear shoes that go over your ankles. If you wear flip-flops in the barn, you know, that's fine. I don't care. You're an adult. You can figure it out, you know, but I'm just giving you answers tonight that will satisfy the questions that we're going to be asked because the way I look at this proficiency test is it's a game they're going to ask you a question you have to give them the right answer um, <clears throat> it may not be what you actually do but it doesn't matter you just give them the answer right that they're looking for so tonight I have I'm I'm trying to go over what pony club says to do and if you agree with it great and if you can improve on that that's good too if you do something entirely different great, um, whatever. So that's it. So I was in charge of doing page 14, the syllabus, which is to fill, it starts with fill and tie a hay net. And so <clears throat> the first thing they ask for is, um, let's see, then we're going to go, okay, to read this, we're going to go feed the feeding and watering of stable horse. And from there, uh, the horse on pasture. So that's the topics for tonight's discussion. So do you wanna go to the next page? Ah. So what you should know about hay is because when we talk about uh, um, doing the hay, I'm sorry, I have a very noisy cat tonight. Uh, he's unhappy. Um, uh, when, when we're filling a hay net, the first thing they ask for is select hay for use. So I wanted to just talk about hay because Hay peppers this whole conversation tonight. There's three kinds of hay you can buy. You can buy a grass hay, or you can buy a, a legume hay, which is a bean, you know, beans are legumes. So that would be like alfalfa and clover. Um, or you can buy a hay that is a mixture of both grasses and clover or alfalfa. Um, so, Clover is kind of hard to um, cure. So you don't often see that in the mix too often um, because some people say that the clover, um, the purple clover can make them bleed internally, but you'd have to eat a lot of clover to do that. And some other people think that it's not the clover itself, but it's a certain kind of, um, um, bacterial mold it picks up that makes it do it. Um, alfalfa, the legumes are heavier in protein <clears throat> and more concentrated in protein. So they're like the higher end um, grasses or, uh, or hays. Orchard grass, timothy, brome grass, and uh, rye grass, they are the lower proteins. And then later on, I think in the charts here, well, or in the in the um, PowerPoint, we'll get to a chart that you can look at and see that, you know, first cutting is usually higher in um, protein than the second cutting and uh, higher in sometimes sugar than the second cutting. Um, so there's different types of cuttings you can get. 
as well, um, depending on what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, so first cutting, as I said, has higher protein and more sugar. Second cutting has less protein and less sugar. Um, if you want your hay analyzed, you can send um, it to your county agent. Um, like with us, I think we have like Penn State Extension in Chester County and they can analyze it uh, for you if you really wanna find out what the protein, the nutrients and the sugar content is. Um, incidentally, the hay in this part of the country is low on selenium. So you might wanna consider giving a selenium vitamin E supplement. Um, I was thinking perhaps, especially because the way like coaching horses are used, um, you know, they do a lot of trotting and then they stand. Um, and in the old days, um, the um, draft horses particularly that pulled like five days a week and then they got the weekend off on Monday morning, they tie up um, because they had all this exercise and then no exercise. So I, I don't know, but I was thinking maybe we as a group really need to keep that in mind because selenium is associated with um, not tying up. If your horse ties up, your vet will tell you to uh, feed selenium. Also, interestingly, I was just tripped across this um, with selenium. I don't know if anybody has horses that crib, but they did some studies on that. And they think that maybe, although it's not official, I think that um, selenium, um, lack of selenium in a diet has to do with cribbing because they had two horses or two you know groups they had the regular group that didn't crib and they had a high higher selenium um, count all the time than the ones that did crib and the ones that cribbed when they were actually cribbing that's when they had the lowest selenium count so I just kind of thought that was interesting um, so anyway hey you'd want to put that in and into your your hay bag, your hay net, haylage, you're probably not putting that into a hay net, but I wanted to throw that in here on this page because it was hay um, and uh, it is, um, let me switch here. It is a, yeah, haylage. This group here, uh, this particular brand, I just copied what they said off the um, off their ad, which is it's a selection of rye grasses allowed to wilt for two days in the pasture, then baled in plastic to preserve maximum nutrition. So it when you open up haylage, I've only had to use it once. Um, it's very dense. It's very like shortcut, and it um, as I recall, it had a very kind of sweet smell to it. It's um, it's very moist. It's um, it's like a sort of like a silage, but it's not. Um, anyway, so they you have it to use because it's dust free. I was using it for a pony who had heaves, and she was very old. Um, constant quality and high nutritional value allows hard feed to be reduced. Um, highly uh, platable convenient to store and handle. In fact, um, some like high-end competitors that are like competing all over the place um, have opted to go to haylage because it's easier to pack and take with them and it's consistent quality. So whether you're at home or you're on the road, your horse is getting the same hay um, basically. And so I thought that was kind of interesting um, that that's the coming trend. But anyway, back to hay. Um, let's see. So there's two ways you can figure out what you're going to do with putting how much you're going to put in your hay net. You can count the flakes or you can weigh it. And obviously weighing gives you a more consistent and accurate uh, amount. Um, a horse on hay should have just two and a half percent of his body weight in hay. And a horse that's being fed grain or a concentrate needs only about one and a half percent his body weight in hay. 
Um, one of the things when you're selecting hay is you want to look for good hay, of course, and you don't want hay that's musty, dusty, moldy, or like a poor color, like yellow, let's say, or brown, because that would have been rained on, probably. Anyway, so when you're looking, when you're buying hay, what you want to do, if you can, is reach down into the bale and pick out a handful rather than looking at the outside of it. Um, color is not an end-all assistant uh, assessment, but uh, in general, it should be bright green, showing that it was cut at the appropriate time um, and that it wasn't rained on and that it quickly was dried outside and baled <clears throat> baled under optimum conditions, most of the nutrients are preserved. Yellow or brown hay means it was left out too long. Um, the stem leaf ratio is important. A lot of leaves and few stems mean that it was cut at the desired maturity. Coarseness tells maturity of the cut plant um, that, that it was like too mature. Uh, mature stems contain marginal nutrition, so you don't really want like mature hay. Sometimes you see that uh, like with the orchard grass, um, you'll see like the, the, the blossoms are all kind of mangled or maybe they're losing their seeds. They were cut too late. Um, good, good hay should have a good smell, it shouldn't smell moldy. Um, So, okay, so now we're going to weigh that. Okay, we've weighed the hay, let's say. And you're going to select your there, Are you on to some other slides or? No, well, we're, we can move to the hay net slide now. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to pick up a hay net. Um, and um, we're going to weigh our hay. And um, there... It, uh, and put it in their hay net. Um, in a minute, I'll show you a, a nifty little hay net or a layer. But anyway, um, the hay net, this, this Palomino has the hay net tied at the correct height. It should be so that it is between their eyes and the point of their shoulder. And uh, when you tie it, you should tie it so a uh, loop like your extra rope through the bottom holes as much as you can so that as it gets, the hay gets eaten, the bag doesn't get lower. Because the thing about hay nets is they can be very dangerous if a horse decides to paw. Um, they can get their foot stuck in it. So you wanna be careful about that. Even, even a small slow feeder hay net they can get their shoe, part of their shoe stuck in it. So you do have to be careful. Um, Pony Club likes rope hay nets over um, nylon hay nets because they're easier to cut. If your horse gets stuck in it, you should have a, you should keep a knife on hand in case your horse does get stuck in it so you can cut it. Um, the other thing is, I think if your horse gets stuck in a rope, one, it's less likely to burn it, you know, burn the skin, you know, rubbing it uh, as much as a, as a nylon one. Um, but there's all kinds of hay feeders out there these days, as you can see. The, the, hey, the Anne, biggest. Um, I wanted to say the nylon hay net. We've yeah. had a problem with older horses' teeth getting worn down unnecessarily by them. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't I'll, use hay nets, so I don't know, but yeah, I believe that. There's a couple of other things with hay nets. Um, they also will affect the muscles in your horse, depending yes. on how you hang I them. I was just going to get into that. Um, that that um, right now, a lot of trainers don't like the idea of hay nets because um, they use, they make the hay, horse use the wrong muscles for what you want to do. Um, because like, let's say, take the uh, Palomino here. He's not lifting his head up too much, but you know, you're, lift, you're, you're using the, 
the neck muscles under here to keep your head up rather than the neck muscles here to um, like as when you would when you were uh, doing dressage using these middle neck muscles. So um, it, it affects like a U neck. And also when they put their heads up, they hollow their back. And that's not a good plan, plan either. So you're correct. Um, yeah. They when, also will twist their heads and constantly eat the same way out of the hay net. So they build up one muscle very strong. Right, um, right. There's, there's also an issue with those boxes. And this is from personal experience. I had a box like that. Um, it came with webbing rather than with the metal and the metal can bother their teeth, but this one came with webbing and I went in the barn to find my horse's hind foot stuck inside the box. Oh, and I had to be cut, bad. Yeah, and I cut I had to cut him out. So if you have shoes on your horse, it was caught between the shoe and the hoof. Yeah, um, that's, that's exactly yeah. why you got to be careful about these hay nets and stuff. I, I mean, I use them. Um, when I go someplace, I tie it to the side of the trailer to keep the horse interested, but I try not to use them on a regular basis. Yeah, that's and I actually, I, I actually recently had someone tell me that um, when, and I think it was from the last uh, study session, that you should always make sure if you're on a long um, trailer uh, trip that your horse has hay to keep its gut moving. Right, um, yeah. that would make sense. Um, because that is, when we're going to talk about feeding, that is the basic, in fact, Debbie and I were just talking about that. That is the basic way a horse works. Um, that but, It's always a slow trickle down theory. It goes through the body, but because they often eat a little bit, but often, you know. Feeding in a trailer is not the same as feeding in a stall. And everything has its good and its bad points and you have to weigh um, what works for you based on the good and the bad and, and whatever. I just caution you about shoes. Right. No, I, I agree with you. I know my, I don't think my horse, I took my pony down to South Carolina. She was not interested in the hay bag the whole time, but um, I did give her gastro guard before I went. <laughs> Um, which I guess is what they're doing these days. Um, it changes through the years. Uh, this is Margaret. Can I, inter I had my vet made a comment to me once I was trailing my horse um, to Aiken, long trip. If they don't drink water on their trailer and eat hay, that's an equally severe problem is not having hay to keep their gut moving. Right. right. So they need to be able to drink on the trailer on these long trips if they're going to be eating hay. Right. Um, yeah. The, the point about eating hay, not the concern with not eating hay on the trailer is not about the gut moving, although I'm sure that's a good thing too, but it's about the stomach being empty and a horse's stomach constantly produces acid and the only thing that will buffer that to keep it from eating away at the stomach lining is saliva, which is a buffer, which is only instigated when a horse is eating something. So, you know, and also having contents, you know, hay in their stomach keeps that acid from splashing up to the part of the stomach that's exposed. So the idea is that if your horse doesn't eat hay on the trailer, which mine does not, and he got ulcers after a long trail ride or long trailer ride to Virginia um, with lots of pro traffic problems. <laughs> um, then you need to do something like ulcer guard, gastroguard, which is a, they're both a meprazole. You need to do that like 20, 48 hours in advance of the trailer ride. And then the whole time they're down there, you know, at a show and after they come back and I'd even keep doing it for like another day afterwards. And it's not a full dose, it's a quarter dose is what they recommend. You don't wanna go on the full dose. That's what they use to cure, to you know heal the ulcers, but you do need that quarter dose. So it's, it's really important to understand if your horse is gonna go for hours without anything in its stomach, you're now 
running that risk of developing ulcers. And believe me, you don't want to have to deal with healing the ulcers. It's very expensive and takes up to eight weeks for them to heal. So definitely want to avoid that. I had a quick question. If does does the, does your horse normally eat on the trailer for short trips? And as the trip gets longer, they decided not to eat? Well, mine doesn't. He just he just doesn't. He sits back on the on the butt bar the whole time, looking out the window. <laughs> He's just not interested in eating, and he you know he tends to be a little high strung. Um, the other thing where an empty stomach is really critical is if you're going to work your horse, you need to be sure that their stomach is not empty because that's when the acid splashes up into the top part of their stomach, which is the tender part that that that's where most of the time the ulcers form. So I now, before I work him, uh, if he hasn't had hay within the last 30 minutes, you want to give them some hay. And I just put like a wheelbarrow of hay in front of him while I'm grooming him. Or um, another thing to do is there's Purina makes something called Outlast, which is, is, that's what it is, a stomach buffer. It's like an antacid. So I'll feed him like a little half a cup of that, and then I'll put the hay in front of him while I'm grooming him. And that's just enough to get something in his stomach so that that acid doesn't splash up into the, what they call the non-glandular portion of their stomach. So empty stomach is not a good thing with a horse if they're, you know, if they're being worked or exposed to stress where they are not going to be eating for a while. Isn't so alfalfa that, supposed to be? Um, yes, alfalfa is a, yes, alfalfa is a good stomach buffer. It, it, what, it is, what it is that's in alfalfa is the calcium. So a calcium supplement is another good thing. I was putting my horse on that while his ulcers were healing. So calcium is a stomach buffer, just like we take antacids, they have calcium in them. Yeah. Yeah, everybody saw the note Julia just wrote in. Uh, she said that when she goes on a trip, she feeds her horses a little alfalfa. It's kind of a special treat. Um, and that also helps. That's a good idea, I thought. Yes. Yep. The other I did, not, too, I did you, not know about that. That's a great idea. You, you can Keeping soak alfalfa. alfalfa cubes, Anne. Right. I've done yeah. that. And, and, that, and, that, and a little beet pulp. Well, yeah. and then the good thing there is they're getting some, some liquid, too. They're getting yeah. some right. water. Right. Yeah. That's an excellent thing for when you're so away. I, I hydrate as much as I can. I make a, a big sloppy. Um, as much different horses will tolerate um, different amounts of water in that product. So if you make it as wet as your horse will tolerate um, prior to shipping, you can also offer it partway through as long as it's not excessively hot. Um, you don't want your beet pulp cooking, but there is a product called Speedy Beet that will make up, and especially in the hotter weather, it will make up in 10, 15 minutes. It doesn't have to soak for half hour, 45 minutes, a couple hours, um, like the other beet pulp does. So you can have that product on hand. And the cost difference is a vet bill, I can tell you. But um, the Speedy Beet makes up twice what the other beet pulp makes up. If you haven't tried it, I would recommend it for those that are- And that's what you do when you're traveling? I do it all winter long, but that was oh, that okay. is something that I would definitely do if I was traveling for sure. Okay. And everything else that Debbie said about the um, gastro. Right. right. Okay. It's good advice. Um, so we are, I think, when to um, knowledge and understanding when and how to soak hay and for the reasons for doing so are discussed. So um, I don't know, I'm sure you all have reasons for different reasons for soaking hay. Um, soaking hay helps to remove the starch in it, which is the carbohydrate energy. So soaked hay is can be fed to a foundered horse um, because you're getting rid of some of the carbs. Um, soaked hay can be fed to a horse with heaves because what you're doing is obviously, you know, tamping down the dust and um, seeds that might, they might breathe in uh, as they're eating it. Um, the longer you soak hay, the more you suck the nutrients out of it. And hay, 
I understand can be soaked um, if you're just doing it for the foundered pony or even or doing it for the COPD or the uh, heavy horse. Uh, it only needs to be soaked 15 minutes to an hour. Soaking hay for a really long time can result in it fermenting. So, or, you know, especially if it's in hot weather. So you don't want to soak it a really long time. Uh, anybody want to add to that? Because I know online there is University of Minnesota put out this like one page thing, but it had all these reasons for soaking hay for certain diseases. You'd have to soak it a longer amount of time because you wanted to suck out a, uh, a certain nutrient. I just left that online. I decided we didn't need to know that. Um, so, uh, and also soaking hay can be used to increase the water intake. Something like your alfalfa cubes, for instance, um, where you soak those. Um, okay, so the next thing would be reasons for selecting hay. And I think we've discussed that sort of what kind of hay the reason you would just pick like one over the other has to do with who you're feeding. Are you feeding a, a slow fat pony? Are you feeding a, a hot racehorse? Are you feeding fox hunting? Are you feeding a horse that's, you know, in maintenance or light work? Um, your grass hays are going to be uh, less protein and sugar and more fiber than your legume hays. So probably most of us would go towards grass hay, I would assume, um, unless we're doing a lot of heavy work with our horses. Um, it also asks, let's see, method of securing hay net is discussed. Oh, we need to talk about that, don't we? You have a page on um, showing how you tie a, a uh, quick release knot. Ah, there we go. Okay, so let's picture on the left is the uh, scale. I thought it was kind of ingenious. They probably weighed the uh, laundry basket and then you can, it's an easy way to weigh your hay, put it in the laundry basket. Um, and then from there into your hay net. Uh, it's recommended by Pony Club that you tie your hay net uh, with a uh, quick release knot so that you can pull it loose if you must. Um, trying to think here, does this, uh, this picture also shows two ways to tie the hay net. Okay, so does it show um, how to tie a quick release knot? Do we have a picture on that? Deb? Um, no, I don't think you sent me a picture on that. Oh, well, then I messed up. I think uh, you can you can Google that. Um, yeah. I saw lots of videos and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I, I think lots of us know how to do that. From I hope so, but anyway. you never know. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty basic knot, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, the, the one the one trick I never really caught on till late in life was see how that there's the the um, it's uh, tied with a quick release and then they stuck the extra loop through the the loop in the quick release um, so that if the pony plays with that they can't untie it um, so I thought that was a good trick um, so and I mean. The only thing about doing it with a quick release knot is that it looks like the same as every other knot in your hay net. And so I've had trouble trying to figure out when I needed to move fast, which rope to pull to get what loose. So I have to say some of us use double end clips and they work well too, even if they're not exactly so, pony. So in that picture perfect. all the way on the right, is there like, are you tying the rope through a couple of places on the hay net to keep it higher from hanging too low or something? Um, yeah, you should be because you're going to have, unless, because unless your hay net is really full or something, it's not going to hang right. 
And even if it is really full, as your horse eats hay, it, the hay net's going to start drooping down lower and lower. So you want to keep it laced up as much as you can so that as it loses hay, it's still going to be no lower than the, like the point of his shoulder so that he can't right. paw and put his foot in it. So, no, that's um, good. I've never, never thought about that, but I do notice when the hay net's getting emptier that it's, you know, Hang, the hay is kind of low down in the yeah yeah it's, I don't know my my hay net has a lot of extra rope I'm like weaving in and out of the bottom of that hay net it seems like forever but um anyway I dropped all my notes so that should make it interesting um I think we need to move on to dusk masks. So it's, it was unclear to me, and I don't know, National Examiner I was talking to, who they were referring to, the horses or us. There's dust masks for both. So um, the dust mask for a horse can be bought at a tax store, presumably. There are some online, I saw one today. Um, I think they, they run all kinds of prices, but I was kind of going, whoa, because one was like $1,100 um, that are used to reduce the amount of uh, dust the horse is going to intake. Um, but um, people could also wear them in the barn. I came across a, an article from one of the horse magazines, which escapes me at the moment, but it was talking about why people should wear a dusk mask in the barn. And um, it was saying that, uh, you know, if you work in the, particularly if you work in the barn all the time, you can get uh, COPD from inhaling dust particles, from handling the hay, and even some types of cancer. And because um, you're in, in breathing in those molds and all kinds of things. So they also suggested keeping the barn doors and the windows open, which is in good practice in any case for, for barns. So I don't know, as I said, which dusk mask he's referring, he's gonna ask us about, but they do the same thing for both people and horses, basically. Does anybody run into dusk masks? Well, we all have lots of N95 masks. Yeah, right I know now. that. <laughs> so I was like, well, we don't have a problem with this. <laughs> I don't think. Um, if you're going to spend $1,100 on a dust mask for your horse because of the what's, you know, the hay, the dust and the mold, you might want to just spend that money on a steamer, um, which also eliminates 90, 90 some percent of the mold spores and the other dust and things like that. So that's, the I find time, that to be very effective. Yeah, the only time I've seen a horse wear some sort of dust mask was they had allergies and this woman yeah. was riding them cross country. Oh, okay. Uh, not, I know, hacking <laughs> cross country. So, um, but yeah, a steamer would, I, I understand a steamer is all that right now. That That's the hot ticket. Um, so let's move on to section two, uh, element 3.4, feeding and watering a stabled horse. So um, it says four common feeds should be identified. And we have um, obviously oats, barley, sweet feed, pelleted feed, um, which are all concentrates or grains. To a different point. It was kind of interesting reading back through all of my pony club books because um, in the 60s, of course, you had to make up your own basically. Well, no, in the 60s, I used to buy sweet feed, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it was you made up your own formula. Like my English pony club book talks about, you know, the amounts of grain or oats you use and the brand the amount of brand you mix it with and the amount of chaff that you mix it with and insists that all high quality barns have a chaff cutter. 
so and so we've gone from that to you know um, big business where like Kentucky Equine Research um, or Research Equine or whatever they call themselves, um, you know, does as do all grain companies, you know, spend a lot of money trying to figure out the perfect formula. So now we have scientists figuring out our perfect formula for us and we don't have to worry about it ourselves. Um, but that's resulted in like a lot of pelleted feeds, which are composites of things your horse need, but you don't really know what's in them. Um, like soy meal is a high protein that's quite, quite frequently in the pelleted feeds um, versus let's say oats. Oats, looking at this, they're not crimped. If you want more nutrition out of your oat, you would have it, buy it crimped. Um, barley, well, we have to talk about how to um, fix these things. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, instead of talking about fixing them, let's just go down the list. We'll talk about grain storage. Uh, you want to store your grain in a place that will uh, be dry and cool and in a container that will be hopefully vermin proof. And what Pony Club likes is like a container that cannot be chewed through. So it would be something like a galvanized trash can. And they like having a um, chain across the top that, that clips onto either side of the trash can. So that, and then goes like through the, uh, you thread the chain through the handle of the top of the trash can. That way it makes it very tough for um, raccoons to get in and uh, pry it open because I, I think I had raccoons in my barn one night because I forgot to put the lid on the trash can and boy, they made a mess. <laughs> they got into the dog food and the cat food. Um, but uh, that kept me, I, then I rem remembered to keep the lid on at all times. Um, Let's see, as far as storing grain, it's you always use up the old grain before new, using, adding new to the can. You don't wanna get a, a layer at the bottom that's moldy. So make sure, you know, first in is first out. Uh, in the summer months, keep your extra amount of grain at a minimum, like don't stock up on lots of bags because it could mold before you get to use it um, with the hot weather. Um, we talk about, um, we want you to be able to talk about taint, mold, and foreign bodies are discussed. So obviously, I mean, common sense, the grain smells or looks off or shows signs of mold, you wouldn't be using it. Bug infested, you probably shouldn't use that either. Um, or if it has rodent fe feces in it, you should be th it should be thrown out. Should there happen to be any dead animals that got packed in it? Uh, along with the bag in the bag, then that bag should be trashed uh, completely. Um, botulism, and that's true for any bales of hay as well. If you come across, like one time, I well, I've come across snakes, dead snakes, and uh, a deer leg uh, in my hay. You need to just throw that out because botulism can be contracted um, by feeding the horses hay or grain that has had pieces of dead animal packed in it. So we don't want that. Um, anybody want anything to add to grain storage? It's pretty bland. I, um, I'd like to ask, um, does anybody have any experience with barley grains? I've never used a barley grain um, and don't really know much about it. Well, I did look it up. I don't think we use it much in this country. Um, yeah. My feeling was when I looked at this page and was pre preparing for it that um, they probably took this page off the proficiency test of the British Carriage uh, yeah. Association um, because we don't use barley grain much in this country. Um, I think it's more English. Um, 
That's but, fine. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah. No, I'm going to get to that in a minute because um, we have to we have to know safe preparation of flax, bran, whole barley, and sugar beet pulp, and the reasons for feeding each. So we'll talk about flax first, um, which is you can read you know where it is. Um, so there's the picture of the whole seed there and then the picture of it ground. And um, <clears throat> flax is full of oils. That, I mean, that's why you would feed it to your horse because um, of its fatty acids in it. But um, it, uh, because it's oily, it will get rancid quickly. So the best way to buy flax seed is to buy it in whole seeds. And a friend of mine recommended you don't buy more than five pounds. Um, at a time. If you and then when you're ready to feed the flax seed, you can have a coffee grinder on hand and just grind it in your coffee um, grinder and uh, feed it to them that way. And I don't think they need that much. Did I read like half a cup. Um, so flax seed is fed because it's high in two polyunsaturated. Uh, fatty acids, um, <laughs> linoleic acid, which is LA and alpha lin linolenic acid, ALA, both referred to as essential fatty, essential fatty acids, promotes a wide range of benefits from helping immu immune function to better hooves and shiny coats. Um, just because you need, they can't produce those kinds of fatty acids themselves, so we have to give it to them. But on the other hand, I don't think they need it a whole, I mean, they need a huge amount of it either. Um, brand. So I guess most of us have worked with brand. Um, generally, brand is made by soaking it in hot water to make a mash. Takes a little while, but not too long. Um, it's considered a good way to add water to a horse's diet uh, when the weather's cold and they aren't interested in drinking much water. You know, it's you kind of think, oh, it's nice to give what them something called? warm to come into from the bar, from being outside all day. Is that um, like a mash? A mash? Yes, that's what it is. Uh, like oatmeal. It's also high in fiber, so you know, it helps move things along, which is important in the winter because in the winter, they don't drink much water. <clears throat> so it helps give them water. Um, and, you know, if it's high in roughage, that can help um, prevent uh, impaction as well. Um, however, people aren't doing this anymore because brand isn't recommended because it's kind of hard on the horses to switch back into brand and yeah. out of brand. And also because the um, calcium to phosphorus ratio is off. So um, the recommended ratio is two to one and it's not that. So if you're feeding your horse like a pelleted feed, you can make a mash out of that uh, by adding hot water to make it soupy. And I can tell you because I do that on cold winter nights, horses will readily slurp that up, you know, whether it's broken down or not. I just put in hot water as hot as I can get it, pour it into their bowls, call them in from the pasture. And by the time they come in, it's pretty cooled off and down it goes. Um, so hopefully I'm getting some extra water into their systems. Um, barley. Now, hold so on a second. Ask, yeah, I have something okay. else to say about the brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, it occasional bran mash is not going to like upset their mineral levels, but they don't recommend feeding bran mashes regularly to young horses because it can cause skeletal problems. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, how about that? Um, uh, the other thing with bran is everybody thought, you know, Sunday evening was a great time to give everybody a bran mash, thinking that it does the same thing for the horse that it does for the human. Yeah, it does not. It's digestive upset. Right. Um, so if you are going to adopt a bran 
part of your feeding program. It needs to be part of your daily regime and not part of a Sunday regime. Right. Or just think of anything. Like if, you know, if, if you're going to go and, you know, you're eating normal food and then all of a sudden you go eat a seven course dinner, it's the same effect on the horse. It's awful. So give them the same thing that they eat. So, and your idea with like soaking what they normally eat in warm water is way better an idea because you're going to do that every night. So right. beat pulp every night, throw right. a couple, you know, tablespoons of flax in, but do it every day. Yeah. Later on in this consistency, go ahead. I'm sorry. Talk will come to 10 rules for feeding. And that's one of them is to say, as they said, you know, not to change your foods overnight. And I was thinking about that with the right. brand Amen. because right. that's exactly what you're doing. You're changing up the feed, which is not ever good uh, to do. Um, I feed the um, ground flax daily, like a bran, mm -hmm. but it's flax and just right. wet it, you know, so, but they get that every day. Do you grind it? It's already ground and I keep it inside oh, okay. so it's dry, cool and not going to be subjected to mold. Okay. Yeah. Cause the, the, the hole, they won't, the hole will go right through them because they won't be chewing it it's being so tiny. Mm -hmm. Um, Barley, you asked about barley. Um, to feed barley to a horse, it has to be cracked, ground, or cooked. I think they usually recommend cooking it. Um, you cook it until it's soft. Uh, barley is a good source of protein and put into a pelleted form or added to a sweet feed often. It's not used in mu much in this country and is expensive. So Oats are generally the protein of choice. And also, as I said before, the U.S. uses a lot of soybean meal in the pellets because it's cost efficient and because it's also a high source of protein. Um, so then we talk about beet pulp. Everybody's used beet pulp one time or another, yes. But um, it's best to soak beet pulp before using, although these days it's said that you can use it without soaking, but if you don't soak it, you run the risk of the horse choking. So I don't know if I use it, I soak it, but I haven't used it in probably 20 years because I don't have ponies anymore. <laughs> but, um, well, that's a lie, I do have a pony. But anyway, um, it's neither considered a hay nor a grain, but has some properties of both. It's very high in fiber, it's low in sugar, uh, if you buy the kind without the molasses added, there's two kinds you can buy with molasses or without molasses. Um, the without molasses is slightly bitter and not as palatable as the uh, molasses variety, um, but you know, horses will eat it. Um, you can feed it, you feed it for its fiber and to help get water into the system. Uh, some feed it, feed it to laminitic ponies to help them keep the weight on. It's also added uh, as a to the sweet feeds as a filler. Um, I don't know. Some people feed it to because it's high in fiber and they hope to keep the weight off the pony, and yet give it some some nutrients, low nutrients. But um, fiber and water is its main category. And it, and it's sugar too, or no? No. It, it's low sugar unless you add molasses to it. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great um, additive for laminitic horses, ponies, or insulin resistant because it is so low in sugar, but it gives them calories if they need the calories. I use it to adjust the amount. And I think, Anne, you re references, you want to feed the amount that's proportional to the work that the horse is going to do. So on the, you know, and to prevent tying up on the days where the horse is not working, I'll cut way back on the beet pulp. Like I might just give half a cup, but if I know that day I'm going to be doing, you know, a, a marathon workout, you know, a cross country workout, I'll maybe give him a couple cups with his feed of the beet pulp. So he gets more calories for energy without them being, um, you know, like excess sugar or excess other nutrients that he doesn't need. So it's just a way of giving them more energy food 
without heating them up, you know, without it being like a sweet feed or anything like that. But you can, you know, go up or down in the amount you give them. Right. I'm a big, I'm a big beet pulp supporter. Um, I learned about it from an old horsewoman 20 years ago. I feed it from um, basically Thanksgiving to Easter during the winter months. I don't feed a lot, about a half a cup. And I do it for the fiber and the water. If you add it to their regular meal, it makes it all wet. So instead of just throwing water on it, I use the sloppy beet pulp and my horses love it. And I do use a speedy beet pulp now. I used to use the regular. I never used the ones with molasses because I have Morgans. And so I'm looking for something that has fiber and low sugar, low, low uh, carbohydrate. Um, and the speedy bowl, really, you don't need a lot. Gosh, I still have half a bag. And the other thing that's good about beet pulp, it doesn't really go rancid. If you keep it in a good dry area, um, if you have a bag for a full year, you're fine because there is no, because it is so dry, you know, you're adding water. So, um, I've had a lot of success with beet pulp. I really like it. Um, if, the, if I didn't feed beet pulp, geez, my horses probably wouldn't have hardly anything to eat because they're Morgans. They don't get anything. So at least they get a little something with beet pulp and a little handful of, uh, you know, grass advantage. That's it. But I like beet pulp. The, the other thing that beet pulp does is um, it helps slow down um, the digestion process of the higher concentrates. And so the, it gives the body more time to absorb the concentrates that you're feeding in either your pelleted feeds or your sweet feeds. Um, and I always recommend, you know, like feeding that particularly in the winter, Alan, like what you said. And then again, if you're going into competition season, um, because it helps slow down um, and not have the energy race through the horse's system. It helps them actually absorb more in the system. So it's, I, I love the product and I love the Speedy Beat, but. I think that's like people, don't they say to eat your vegetables first before you eat your meat because the vegetables have more roughage more and they take longer to, uh, yeah. to digest. Yeah. So same thanks. thing. Yeah, thanks, Ann. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Feeding people is a lot like feeding horses in some ways. Um, it's all about the calories and the exercise. Um, so getting on to that. Okay, so we the next thing would be to discuss various samples of hay and haylage, which we've already done. Um, and so then we'd move on to quantity and type of feed to be given in relationship to size and workload are discussed. Um, I started to give a lot of thought to this because, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of, you can go really deep into this. And yet I don't think this proficiency test is gonna expect us to go too deep because like if we're learning the parts of the horse and the parts of the harness, um, I, I think that the amount of knowledge we have to have for what and how to feed is going to be pretty basic. So um, again, rather than talk about, I'm, I'm just skipping the fact that there's vitamins and mega calories and minerals and percentages of protein and all that kind of stuff, just to say that grass is the natural food of horses. And we should try to stick as closely as possible to their natural diet. Uh, we do mess it up in many ways because one, we work them. And two, we, we uh, Debbie and I were talking about, you know, um, we put them in barns and boarding barns make cost decisions based on what's cost least to feed rather than, you know, maybe what is the way they eat. Um, so you get all kinds of um, bulges in, the, in what should be. But in general, a horse, the more the horse works, the more calories he's going to burn. So, and he will need to replenish them. The type of feed may change as he, re, as he reaches pit, uh, peak fitness uh, to support growing muscle strength. Um, however, most of our horses are on maintenance or light work 
uh, side of the equation and um, they don't need that kind of food. They may not need more than grass or hay and a basic uh, balancer pellet, which is kind of like a vitamin pill in that it provides the nutrients that they lack uh, getting from hay or grass. I have to say both my horses are on grass or hay in the winter and a balancer and a minimum amount of balancer pellet and uh, keeping weight off is more the issue than keeping weight on. Um, the size and type of the horse, temperament of the horse, is gonna also be taken into account whether you have like an easy keeper or whether you have one that's really nervous and can't keep weight on. Um, Uh, if you have like a hard keeper uh, and you just get them, you might try uh, worming him thoroughly and then um, having his teeth looked at uh, very thoroughly to see what kind of condition it is. It could be that he just cannot, I, I don't know, I had one old horse that was given to me and he just couldn't eat hay because his teeth were worn down so much. So we ended up feeding him um, equine senior in a mash and that was a total feed for him and he put on weight tremendously so it really depends on who and what you've got but a healthy horse uh, and a young horse isn't going to need a lot of a lot of feed um, and I know pony, one of pony club's big rules is you know you want to feed way more roughage than concentrate which is feed way more hay than grain um, you guys all take care of your horses. You probably know that. Um, Debbie has found a terrific website uh, that can help you determine exactly what your horse's needs are. Um, Debbie, you want to talk about it? Yeah, yeah, sure. I've been using this tool. I'm going to call it. It's a it's a web based application called Feed Excel. It was developed actually by a nutritionist in Australia, but I've been using it for probably three years or so. And, you know, if, if you've ever tried to calculate some of the nutritional requirements for your horse based on their weight and their level of activity, as um, Anne's been referencing, and then try to translate that and calculate whether what you're feeding them meets those requirements, you know, you kind of have to be like a, a math genius sometimes to, to do that, cal those calculations. It's very um, convoluted. So this little tool has a database of like zillions of commercial products, you know, um, all for, not just grains and concentrates, but supplements and balancers. And then they also include so, uh, forages and, and certainly things like haylage would be in there. So all the brand names you can imagine, I, literally, I've never had a problem where something hasn't been in there. And you just basically select what you're currently feeding your horse and what amount, and then it will calculate all the nutritional content that they're getting versus what's recommended for what your horse is doing. You, you fill out a profile of your horse first, their weight, their um, age, their breed, you know, what kind of work they're doing. Do they have any um, issues like insulin resistance, you know, um, equine metabolic syndrome or tying up um, those kinds of things. And then it'll calculate for you. So the little chart down in the lower right-hand corner is showing this person that the, the diet that their horse is getting is deficient in copper, zinc, selenium, and iodine, for example. Um, the other thing it'll do, if you look at the, the center bottom little diagram, it'll show you that for each nutritional element like calcium, it'll tell you what, what portion of their diet is providing that element. So in the case of the calcium there, a certain percentage is being supplied by grass, certain percentage by oats, certain by alfalfa, hay, and then a, another amount by their pellets. So you can see the breakdown and it helps you adjust the amount that you're feeding to try and um, make sure that you're meeting the 100% recommended amount. It'll also tell you if, you know, okay, if, if, for example, in the lower right-hand corner, it says that horse is getting, I think like 400% of the iron 
requirement. It'll tell you whether that's a concern or not. Like, is that too bad? Is that bad that, that your horse is getting 400% of what it really needs in iron? Or is that going to cause any issues or side effects? So that as well. And then up in the center um, diagram there, it talks about the cost. So you, after you've put all the amounts in and the brand names of everything you're doing, it'll calculate what it's costing you to feed them per day. So that can help you adjust you know, maybe I can find a cheaper product that'll give me the same nutritional value and, you know, save some money. So I, I highly recommend this. I couldn't do without it now. I thought I would only use it for my competition horse, but I have two older horses and it's, it's just, they, they're all very different in their, their sizes and, and their um, issues. I have, you know, the mare that's insulin resistant. So it's really been helpful. I feel so much more confident that what I'm feeding my horse is is helping them meet the requirements of what they're doing, especially my competition horse, just because you know he's working hard and and needs increased um, requirements for nutritional benefits. So I highly recommend it. the The URLs down there in the lower left hand corner, if you want to check it out, they do have like a trial period. You know, you can subscribe to it you just subscribe to it is all you know there's no software to download or anything like that it's just a web-based system is it a is there a cost involved oh yeah there's a cost if you decide to sign up for it you can pay i think you can pay on a monthly or if you want to save some money you can pay on an annual basis yeah and the other thing is that this company has a, a knowledge base on there like they have a whole section on gastric ulcers and you know all the the latest on that and um, lots of other feeding topics are in there and they also have almost every week it seems like they have a, a zoom webinar on some topic of nutrition so it's you know they're very active They've, they're constantly updating and upgrading um, the tool so I think it's been well worth the money for myself anyway I yeah, and also as, as uh, Julia pointed out on the uh, chat here um, various uh, feed reps are sometimes a good source of knowledge too. I know um, when I first started researching this, I um, read the page and panicked and uh, texted uh, Steve Berkowitz, my vet, and said, oh, can you help me do my homework here? And he's like, yeah, no, go call so-and-so at uh, Oxford Feed. Um, their their rep she'll be real helpful because I guess that's what he listens to so there you go you know <laughs> it, it you can there's a, a couple different sources but um, certainly feed Excel doesn't have any particular bias um, which would be good I suppose um, I think one of the things we have to discuss um, also oh well back up just a minute give this um, if you can, Deb, to the back, page nine. Oh, page nine. Yeah. Sorry. There you go. Yeah, it says page nine and page eight. Um, well, you don't have to um, back it up, but these are some charts I pulled out of the B Manual of Pony Club. And I thought they were interesting because like here it's talking about the alfalfa, early bloom, mid bloom, or orchard grass. Um, and you can kind of see um, immature orchard grass versus mature, um, how that over the course of the summer, let's say it goes to um, less digestible energy and um, less crude protein. Um, and I think there's another chart sort of about the grains of the same way. So if you want those charts, um, now that I've downloaded them on my phone, I can send them to you if you just want to look at them sometime. Or I guess you can look at them through here because you can control yeah, the... Yeah, I'll be posting the slides with your video. Right, you can yeah. control the speed of the slide as you want. Um, okay, we can go back. Okay, so um, this is the 10 good rules of feeding, which is old pony club, but always good. Um, I'll just, um, we were talking about, we've been talking about this whole time um, about the gastric 
problems that we've had and, and empty stomachs and working on full stomachs. And so, you know, Pony Club first says, feed little and often. This is, um, you know, based on the way a horse naturally lives. What is it they say in the West? The wild herds walk like 10 or 20 miles a day or something like that because they're constantly, they need like 2,000 acres to feed off of because there's not much hay out there or grass out there. So they have to eat something, walk, eat something, walk. Um, so they're always getting little bits, but not a big chunk. Here in the East, you know, especially this time of year, you got a 10 foot square of grass and you've probably got lots of clover in it and all kinds of fattening stuff and they don't even have to work at all to just to uh, eat that down to the ground. Um, so they're not getting a lot of exercise. Um, fortunately, my horses decide after that they're going to walk in the shed and they stay there for a couple hours. But um, OK, feed plenty of bulk food. I just talked about that, which is hay. Um, as I've said before, grass is the natural food of horses. Um, if they uh, feed according to the work they're doing, um, make changes in their food gradually, uh, keep the same feeding hours. Um, it's, that helps their regularity and their digestion. Uh, feed clean and good quality forage only. Like, don't feed stuff that has bugs, feces, animal parts, mold, dust, must, whatever in it. Um, never exercise a horse on an empty stomach. Um, this is an addition of Debs, but it's Debbie's, but it's good. Uh, do not, I don't know what that says. What does that say over there? Do not, uh, by, uh, number eight, I don't know. Um, well, anyway. Uh, we'll go to number nine, feed fresh water at, uh, or fresh water, clean water should be available at all times. And 10, salt should be available at all times. So they ask us to talk about water. Um, where does it talk about water? Uh, I know it does talk about water. So. What, number um, nine? Number nine says feed clean water. I mean, fresh clean water should be available at all times. Right. And that's what I was going to say, um, because it, it mentions this in the syllabus somewhere, not that I'm seeing it, but they talk about uh, water several times in the syllabus. So they really want you to know, be able to tell them that you need, that the horses need water. Um, if not available, uh, water should be offered to your horse every hour, according to Pony Club. We were talking about the trailer. I don't know how practical that is, but um, that is the Pony Club answer. I was trying for every two hours when I was traveling. And sometimes I didn't make that, to be honest. Um, horses are less likely to drink water in cold winter weather and have been shown that they are much like, more likely to drink water. Um, if the water is warm. So um, you can also add a teaspoon of salt to their feed to encourage them to drink. Uh, make sure they have a salt block. Um, but uh, drinking water in the winter is highly important to keep the gut system moving. In the summer, the horses are more likely to drink colder water than warm water. Automatic waters are a great way to keep water um, from freezing out in the pasture because they've got a heat system in them and um, ensuring there's fresh water at all times. And <laughs> no, don't think that they can eat snow and that will take care of their water supply. I was, one of the things about having a Dales pony is I followed several Dales groups online and Dales are an English pony, so they're all English. And I think they had like the big freeze, like two years ago over in England. And they were in over their heads with what to do. They're bringing in their frozen buckets and going, yeah, they're frozen. So we're putting them by the furnace. And, you know, um, yeah, no, well, don't worry about it. They'll eat snow, they'll be fine. And I was thinking, yeah, no, no, that's not gonna work. Um, but um, 
anyway, uh, horses will drink up to 20 gallons a day, although it's more likely they drink 10 to gallon, 10 to 12 gallons a day. So two buckets should be in their stalls so that they have plenty of access. Um, these are just different ways to feed the horse because I think at some point here in the, in the um, feed the horse water, because at some point in the uh, syllabus, they also ask you to talk about how to get water to the pasture. Um, so we'll maybe come back to that later. Can we go um, back to the salt block a second? Because John and I argue, I have only ever fed the white salt blocks and or salt in their feed that's the white salt or Himalayan right. salt or whatever. He believes that they should have the brown trace mineral block in there as well. And so does his uncle. So I go and argue with them all the time. Um, I don't think it harms them, but I don't think the brown trace salt blocks have the all the minerals. Like they're more for cows, aren't they? I don't know if they're more for cows, but um, I thought I read somewhere that um, Pony Club prefers the mineral. Yeah, I, I saw I just, that. But I, I always put both out. And uh, I find that different times of the year, they're more inclined to, to want the, um, the mineral one, the brown one. And other times of the year, they seem to like the white. So I yeah, just- We have both now too. And they yeah, do, it's just easier. They do go back you can get them in the blocks. And, mm -hmm. and also I find that some horses prefer one over the other. It, they're like people. They're not all the same. Right. Oh, My uh, horses seem to really like that Himalayan salt. Yes, every one of them likes that. Yeah. Yeah, like candy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're they're $19 a copy. The um, trace mineral 25 pound blocks are about 10 bucks. The white salt blocks are about 10 bucks. And I just did a salt experiment because I have a horse that eats salt like I've never seen any other horse in my life eat salt. Um, and I gave him a choice between the trace and the white. And he is licking the ground now because I had to pull the salt away from him because he was so insistent on it. Wow. And he was drinking probably 20 plus gallons of water a day. And if you bring him in, you know what that means for your bedding cost. So which one did he like, the white or the, the dark? He went initially for the white and then he concentrated on the trace because I was always told that the trace mineral block had tra like literally like trace amounts of mineral in it. But these horses can taste that. And now he's licking the mud off the ground where the salt lick was sitting in a tub, you know, like one of those salt block holders. Yep. And the salt leached through. Sure. So he's, yeah. dug, uh, he's licked a hole in the ground and then sticks his muzzle in the trough and makes that clear, lovely galvanized tub look like a mud pit. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I know he's, I, I've fed thousands of horses through my career and, and my life, and I've never had anything like this. So if anybody has any kind of input on what to do with the horse that's addicted to salt, I'm, I'm you gotta say, do you think he's like lacking in something? I think he was. So I thought I'd throw, you know, 50 pounds of salt at him and give him a month and figured, okay, well, the first two days he gallops to the salt lick. And I'm not kidding you. Um, and then if he's deprived of it for a couple of days, he gallops back to it and stands there for 20 minutes and licks the salt. It's crazy. Yeah, you would think his mouth would become sore from all that. I, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about a million other things with excessive amounts of salt. But yeah, uh, he's, well, as he's long as he has the access to the water, because if he had all the salt and not access to water, that would be a problem. Oh, well, yeah, he's he's got a 100 gallon water tank, but. Anyway, it, he's he's the extreme example, but um, salt is imperative to have for most. Um, and then I've I've moved the other salt like over to the girls' field, and they're not they're barely touching it. So, yeah, I was basically always taught you can give them a choice of one or the other, but don't make the mineral be the one you only give. Correct. That's you know it, you can give white and dark, but don't just give dark. Correct. One of the other things that you might um, take notice of, if you're working a horse hard, they can't get in enough salt by licking it, that you really do need to think about electrolytes and, you know, feeding in your, your grains. 
I totally agree with that. They say a horse's tongue is not really meant to lick like a cow's tongue is. That horses, salt licks for, don't really work effectively for horses because their tongue is not, they tend to want to chew it and bite at it. But, and I've, I've noticed that with my horses, they'll like crumble it, but their licking ability isn't the same as a cow's and that you want to be sure that they're getting electrolytes or salt in their there's feed, you know, and, that you're supplementing, um, uh, you know, you're supplementing a, an, an amount, a known amount, because you don't know whether they're licking it or not, or whether they're licking it enough. So if you make sure they get what they need in their diet, in their feed, then you don't have to worry about it. You can put the salt licks out there if they want more salt, but at least you know they're getting the minimum requirement. Right. And to your point, Deb, I think, you know, like with your competition horse, I mean, when you're when you're getting ready to load them on the trailer, when you're getting ready to go away for the weekend, you definitely want to add the electrolytes. And if it's summer and stuff, electrolytes are a completely different subject than I think a salt lift. Yeah, for me, yeah. personally, they are. Definitely. But um, good, good point on the electrolyte. Well, so how much salt does a horse need? Well, it depends on the horse. So that's why I, that's why I like this Feed XL because it tells okay. me exactly what they needed. So. I, that, I actually give them, um, Smart Pack has a pelleted salt supplement because my horses, if I just throw the salt in with their food, they won't eat it. So I use this pelleted salt and then I know they're getting exactly what they need. I mean, it doesn't look like pelleted salt. It looks like pellets, like feed pellets, but it's got salt in it. So well, I just use out. the regular white salt. I just sprinkle a tiny bit in, but you have to remember, get the ionized. Yeah, definitely. You, if, you're, like, if you're gonna throw it in there, shortage you know. on that. <laughs> if you're gonna use salt like that, make sure it's. Did you say light, Helen? You you want to use the light, like the Morton's? No, light. ionized. Okay, well, light salt, I believe, is ionized. So you want to use light salt if you're gonna use a human salt, um, to yeah, top I, dress. Yeah, I don't. And that has potassium as well as um, calcium. Correct. So that's more along the lines of electrolytes rather right. than plain Correct. salt. Correct. So you want to use light, if you're going to top dress with human salt, you get the light salt, like Morton's light salt or Kirkland light salt, whatever. But light salt is what you want to feed the horse to okay. achieve an electrolyte compensation if you're going to go that direction. It wasn't for uh, electrolytes. It was just to add, you know, to Debbie's point. The stuff out in the field is what they want. I always just put a little on their feed every day. Great. Well, as Debbie said, that way you know what you're get, what they're getting and that they're getting it. Um, do we want to move on to the horse on pasture now? Because um, the first thing they want to discuss is how and when to supplement the horse, the pastured horse's food. Um, so to back up a little bit, we were talking about, um, again, the horse eats little and often, the horse's natural food is grass, and that we should supplement, start with that and supplement from there. Um, so there's, there's like pastured horse, there's like all kinds of definitions of pastured horse. If you talk to the English, they're talking about the pastured horse is the one turned out on uh, common land, 4,000 acres of dales, and they're just living out there, living large out there. But, um, and if you talk about pastured horse here, uh, you know, maybe we're talking like turnout, um, a horse on, on turnout board or something like that. Um, so there's different, obviously there's gonna be different needs there. Um, but um, we try, as we've been saying all along tonight, we try to supplement their needs, um, their, their nutritional needs with um, grains or pellets or sweet feed. Um, and they may only need a balance or pellet. Um, it's recommended that uh, grass be kept, used to be recommended anyway, that grass be kept at eight inches to prevent weeds um, most pastures these days are overgrazed, so eight inches would be 
high. <laughs> Um, but uh, we have smaller pastures, and so um, with our smaller pastures, we need to um, have the manure removed regularly or dragged, so to keep um, the uh, so that the the manure will dry and the parasite eggs will die. Pastures should be regularly mowed uh, down to keep the weeds down and encourage tender grass because that horses will ignore the grass that has grown into. Uh, coarse leaves and so you want them to not eat patches, overgraze patches and leave other patches uh, high. Um, possibly lime every couple of years with maybe use a herbicide and uh, fertilizer can be applied. We use a um, pasture management guy and he's transformed our pastures amazingly. Uh, we used to have pastures full of um, yellow with um, buttercups and he's gotten rid of all the buttercups. The downside was he got rid of all the uh, clover when he got rid of all the buttercups. But in retrospect, I don't mind that too much because the grass has grown back in those empty spots and, and he's um, used um, fertilizer to help that happen. So our pastures look greener and better than they ever have. Um, but then we're also down to two horses and we used to have like five ponies and that also makes a difference. Um, if you um, don't have enough grass, you'll have to supplement with hay. Uh, uh, if you're using um, ground level mangers, like for the big rolls, there's no, make sure there's no way they can get their foot stuck in it. Um, if using the big huge bales, make sure the ropes are removed. Unless you have many horses to clean up that big bale very quickly, it will start to mold by the, uh, with the first time it gets rained on. So make sure you have a cover or uh, a manger that it can be placed in that can cover it and protect it from the rain. Um, also, make sure all horses can get into it and away from it quickly. Make sure the horses are getting the, all the horses can get access to the hay. Um, also, uh, another good plan for pasture management is to rotate your pastures. Um, so um, you can see on the left here, he's um, set up kind of a temporary fencing uh, to um, give that pasture a chance to rest while he turns them out into the greener pasture. Um, I didn't put bad on this. This is weed. Somebody else put bad on this about weed control because uh, the pasture is full of weeds. Um, also, I have to say that um, one of my friends had a round bale manger, the kind that kind of have the V, these, the wires, not wires, uh, tubes, it's um, metal tubing. It looks like a drum um, to put their bale in and their horse got caught in the hoof got caught in it. And it was apparently caught in it all day. He was pretty badly damaged by the end of the day when they went out to figure out why he hadn't come up for dinner. Um, so be careful with those things because I'm looking at their round one here going, I wonder if he can get his hoof through there. Um, <clears throat> let's see, feeding several horses turned out together would be the next thing that we're talking about. And so if you're feeding grain to outdoor horses, make sure the feed tubs are quite a distance from each other and out in the open. Um, they, uh, so the horse can escape if another horse bullies them. Um, the problem with feeding everybody outside loose is that if they're not all getting the same amount and the same food and eating at the same rate, some are going to be stealing from others. I haven't even looked at it yet. Um, I've got to eventually. You've got a horse that's on medication or a slow feeder. You may want to catch him and feed him separately outside of the pasture area. Bullies may have to be removed from the herd while you're feeding. Um, feeding hay on the ground, uh, make more, when you're feeding hay on the ground, make more piles than there are horses so that uh, everyone can get a pile. Um, 
And then they go back to asking you about the water. Why should you check on your water? Um, obviously, make sure there's water there, that the water's clean. If using an automatic water, that it's working, that there are no dead animals in the water. One time I found a dead crow in mine. Um, that there aren't any feces in the water, because I have lots of animals that like to come and sit on the edge of my water and uh, defecate in it. Um, anyway, um, in the winter, you need to check to see that the water isn't frozen. Thank you for bringing this back. Um, so then they say, talk about your various ways of delivering water. So up on the upper right, left, uh, the other right, uh, we have the trough, which uh, um, allows plenty of water to be offered. Uh, it may be, you can, it's pretty easy to scrub, might be heavy to move if you're trying to dump the water. Uh, occasionally the horse may step in it. Um, it may need an ice melting device to keep in the winter if they're gonna use it through the winter. Um, if you go to a um, automatic water, which is right below it, um, they're pretty easy to use once you get them set up um, because they constantly fill. And also the, um, the one up here that you see on the upper right is also an automatic water. Um, and the um, thing about those that I really like is that they have an electrical heating eye in them that allows them the water to stay warm. So my horses actually like to drink out of them in the winter um, because the water is not warm, but it's it's tepid and tepid, tepid, tepid. And um, it's easy to drink and they will drink plenty of water that way. Um, plus it's um, pretty easy to clean out. You just take out the dish and brush it out and put it back in. Um, so you can also use a bucket. Buckets are convenient, lightweight, and easy to clean. Um, doesn't offer much water in the long term, so you may have to use multiple buckets. Water also can freeze easily in the bucket and get hot in the summer, so it can tip over easily if it's not like tied to a fence. Uh, so it's maybe not the best thing for outdoors, but they're great for stalls. Um, creeks. Creeks may be polluted or dried up in the winter or the summer rather. They might be frozen in the winter. They might be muddy after a big rainstorm. They might carry parasites. Ponds. Ponds can be stagnant. So probably for those reasons, you don't want to use like natural water sources. Um, you'd probably be better using uh, water piped in. Um, some of these tubs can also have uh, be attached to a water system with like a ball and cock on it so that as it gets drunk that it will fill up automatically. Except I haven't figured out how they clean them yet, but I'm sure there is a way. Uh, where are we now? We are reasons for checking on the horse in the pasture. Again, we're talking about horses on pasture. So, in the summer, or even in the winter, you wanna catch your horse daily. And the reason for that is because you wanna be able to catch them when you need them, uh, whether he's retired or working. Um, I had a horse one time that it took him, took us, used to take us 45 minutes to catch him because the only time he got caught was when he uh, was worked. And so he always associated being caught with work and eventually he, began to associate with us that we might catch him because we wanted to feed him dinner. So he got easier to catch by the time he got old, but that was interesting. Uh, anyway, so why do you catch a horse every day um, and check on him if he's living in a pasture? Because he should be checked for cuts, injuries, illness, or lameness. He may need some fly spray or a fly mask in the summer if muzzled. Uh, the muzzle net definitely needs to be checked. Make sure it's not rubbing on them, um, that it's not, um, you know, misplaced. 
The pasture every day should be checked for damage for, to the fencing, make sure it has adequate water. If there's an electric fence that the current is flowing through the wire, make sure the pasture is free of trash and holes. Um, groundhogs are, are great for putting in that hole that wasn't there yesterday. Um, check for poisonous plants, check on the status of the grass. If the horses need to be rotated uh, to a new pasture or needs a deep hay supplement started, um, check the shed uh, to make sure no wasps are building a nest um, in it. Um, we can go to poisonous plants. We go to poisonous plants. Where is poisonous plants? Maybe I didn't do a poisonous plant thing. How about that? Okay, we can talk about poisonous plants. So here are some of our local plants that are poisonous. Uh, deadly nightshade um, makes like a little purple tomato. It's kind of a tomato plant. Um, buttercups, you all know. Milkweed, I think is pretty familiar. Pokeweed um, is that big, tall plant with broad green leaves. Um, it's pretty common. Um, red maple leaves, uh, if you have a red maple uh, near the pasture, um, when the leaves fall off the tree, they can be uh, poisonous to the horses. Um, wild cherry, if it falls down or a branch falls off in the pasture and the leaves wilt, then it's poisonous because it has like a cyanide in it. And when it wilts, it becomes poisonous. So these are six poisonous plants you can name if he asks you what are poisonous. And as I said, a herbicide will really cut out your buttercups if you want them gone. The thing about horses and buttercups is I guess you've probably noticed is that as long as there's other grasses around, they won't eat the buttercups. And then um, the buttercups die out pretty quickly. Like they're in full bloom now, but when they stop blooming, the leaves shrivel up and then they're kind of gone till next year. So what do we have next? Types of fencing. Uh, okay. So we are supposed to discuss types of fencing and its merits. So in general, all fencing should be at least three foot six inches high. It should be tight and secure and easy for the pony to see. Uh, wood fencing is a good safe option, um, easy to see, but the horses can chew on it. Um, it also rots quickly. As a person who's had post and rail or split rail fencing for years and years. I mean, the posts rot about every 10 years, I think, uh, or maybe a little longer, but, and the, and the split rails uh, constantly need replacing. So we finally gave that up because the pony decided that once they got old, she could just work them loose, which she did. And she walked over to the neighbor's property which neighbors that hate horses, of course. Um, so we ended up putting up the, the diamond mesh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you can have vinyl covered boards or plastic rails or plastic strips. They're safe and easy to see, but they're expensive. Um, here they have the polymer rail. Um, they have um, also, it looks like kind of the polymer rail as a top line on the mesh, diamond mesh fencing and also with the wire with the top rail. Um, the diamond mesh is what we got. And the reason we got it was because we put up some, when we initially moved here 30 some years ago to keep our horses, well, to keep the toddlers that live next door and the dogs next door out of our pasture. That's why we put up the mesh. And what we found was that we still have that mesh fence today. We've long since replaced the uh, split board and rail many times. So a mesh fence is really expensive, but it seems to last a really long time. We have wood boards across the top. 
the downside of the mesh fence is I, I was taking one of my horses out and he was in a real rambunctious mood and I was starting to remove his halter. So I unhitched the throat latch and he just took off, pulled the rope out of my hands and ran to the other end of the field up to the fence. And then he was kind of standing there and I'm like, come on back. And he wouldn't come back. So of course I had to walk all the way, the length of the field to get to him. Well, there was a reason he couldn't come back to me and wasn't running around. And that was because the open throat latch had whacked itself against the fence and latched onto the fence. And so there he was, his head was tied to the fence. So not that I keep halters on, but uh, you might keep that in mind. And somebody at the last meeting here last week was saying that um, one of their horses or somebody's horse had a blanket on and they got the uh, um, one of their clips, like the chest clips say, stuck in the mesh. So that's something to think about. Um, but other than that, I like mesh fencing. Um, you want, if you're gonna get a mesh fencing, you want fencing that is, um, the, the holes in it are small enough that they can't get their hoof through. You don't want that big mesh fencing um, like they use for sheep and goats because they can get their hoof through it and then they'll be in trouble. Um, down at the bottom, we have wire with top rail. Um, that seems highly visible, so that's not too bad. Um, I've also seen, I don't know, maybe you've had experiences like this. I've also known two horses when they got added to a pasture that had wire. Um, the wire wasn't well marked. And the first thing those horses did was try to, they went off top speed galloping through the field, didn't realize the wire was there and sliced themselves up pretty good. Um, so I don't know, wire's not my favorite thing. Um, electricity, electric fences are cheap, requires electricity, um, obviously. And now we have solar panels, so that's good, uh, which should be properly grounded. Not as secure, not secure as fencing by itself, unless you've got real good ponies. Um, can be used with other fencing to keep animals off the fence. Should be checked daily to make sure it's working. Um, barbed wire, I haven't seen barbed wire for years. Um, I did rent a field when I was a kid that had barbed wire and um, the horse I was taking care of for the week when I went to go off on a trail ride, he decided to come along and jump the barbed wire and he got really torn up. But if you're using barbed wire, the bottom wire should be at least two feet from the ground to discourage ponies from pawing over it. It's not suitable for small paddocks or pastures. Avoid using it if possible. And the other points of gates and fencing in general is to, uh, the gates should be wide, the fence post should be solid and set deep. Avoid using metal uh, fence posts as they can injure a horse that's trying to jump out. Um, other points with pastured horses um, that he does, they don't really ask about, but we should probably mention to them is horses should have access to shelters to shelter them from wind or rain or snow and to hide from the flies in the summer. Um, the shelter should be big enough for all horses in the field and should have a large entrance. Uh, anybody can get in and out. And horse and salt should be available to pastured horses, which I think we just discussed. Um, one last thing they ask is grooming the pastured horse. So here again, I was like, okay, what are, what are they really asking here? Um, so I'm really not sure what they were really asking, but I went back in history again and um, read the old Pony Club book and the new Pony Club books. And basically they they just refer to the fact that, you know, horses out in the open are gonna be subject to more weather obviously than a horse that's stable. So you can't be washing off their natural oils and their natural scruff so much um, because they need that, uh, especially when the weather 
gets colder and they need a little waterproofing and a little warm um, scruff to keep them warm. So um, I ended up copying here the Manual of Horsemanship of the British Horse Society and Pony Club edition 1969. And it read, the skin, if a pony is living a natural life, is thoroughly in healthy condition. Under such conditions, grooming should be limited to attention to the feet, a good, good brush down with a dandy brush or rubber body brush so they may be kept tidy and sponging out the eyes, muzzle and dock. So they're suggesting that you don't want to wash the bejesus out of them. Um, in this day and age, especially with us competing, we tend to find the need to spiff them up and wash them. And so, but um, as I say, most of us aren't like having them live out in, you know, 4,000 acres of pasture lands where we may see them or may not see them. So, um, I don't know, as I said, I don't really know why they're asking that or what they're discussing, but that's the answer I think that would be a suitable for it. So do you have any questions? Want to comment or should we just get off because it's nine o'clock? <laughs> I want to thank you, Anne, for offering to do this. And I know you did a lot of homework to prepare for this, so I appreciate that. And thanks to everybody that had comments um, and additional advice and experience. That was really helpful too.